comes from Hebrews 11, 13 through 30, and 39 through 40. Please stand for the reading of God's word. All these people died still believing what God had promised them. They did not receive what was promised, but they saw it all from a distance and welcomed it. They agreed that they were foreigners and nomads here on earth. Obviously, people who say such things are looking forward to a country they can call their own. If they had longed for the country they came from, they could have gone back. But they were looking for a better place, a heavenly homeland. That is why God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. It was by faith that Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice when God was testing him. Abraham, who had received God's promises, was ready to sacrifice his only son, Isaac, even though God had told him, Isaac is the son through whom you, your descendants will be counted. Abraham reasoned that if Isaac died, God would be able to bring him back to life again. And in a sense, Abraham did receive his son back from the dead. It was by faith that Isaac promised blessings for the future to his sons, Jacob and Esau. It was by faith that Jacob, when he was old and dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and bowed in worship as he leaned on his staff. It was by faith that Joseph, when he was about to die, said confidently that the people of Israel would leave Egypt. He even commanded them to take his bones with them when they left. It was by faith that Moses' parents hid him for three months when he was born. They saw that God had given them an unusual child, and they were not afraid to disobey the king's command. It was by faith that Moses, when he grew up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to share the oppression of God's people instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. He thought it was better to suffer for the sake of Christ than to own the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking ahead to his great reward. It was by faith that Moses left the land of Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He kept right on going because he kept his eyes on the one who is invisible. It was by faith that Moses commanded the people of Israel to keep the Passover and to sprinkle blood on the doorposts so that the angel of death would not kill their firstborn sons. It was by faith that the people of Israel went right through the Red Sea as though they were on dry ground. But when the Egyptians tried to follow, they were all drowned. It was by faith that the people of Israel marched around Jericho for seven days and the walls came crashing down. All these people earned a good reputation because of their faith, yet none of them received all that God had promised. For God had something better in mind for us, so that they would not reach perfection without us. This ends the reading. You may be seated. Well, good morning, everybody. Here we are, moving into the closing chapters of the book of Hebrews. I want to thank Pastor Jeanette for her message last Sunday. She had what I think was probably the toughest, and I know it was the longest chapter in the book of Hebrews. She did a commendable job with that and brought us a very compelling message. So I thank Jeanette for that. I also want to... Uh, encourage you to grab the outline in your bulletin so you can follow along and I want to correct something there real quick too that word at the top in the statement I quoted it says bad it really is supposed to say badge so add the GE on there and that sentence will make sense okay just take your pen and add that in there and that'll be great all right well, after hearing extensively about the Hebrew sacrificial system and all about how it worked in chapters 8, 9, and 10, and learning really that all of that animal blood that was shed was really just a setup for the coming of Jesus who would sacrifice his own life on the cross, shed his own blood. Now the author turns to a subject that we're more familiar with in the church, that we talk about quite a bit that's really very foundational to what we believe, and that is faith. Chapter 11 is really all about faith and what it means to live by faith. And the examples that are given are arranged chronologically, but if you look more closely, you will notice there's also a topical way that they're grouped. That is to say that some key aspect of faith is being called out 
with each one of these groups of people, and that aspect of faith is being commended to us so that we understand and learn from it. In the context of the whole letter, which we have seen is really about not giving up in the face of opposition, in the face of trouble, in the face of persecution. The author is saying to us now, let me tell you about those who have gone before you and trusted God and everything that was accomplished through their faith. Starts out by defining faith. It says, faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. Now, I want to call attention to two words that are there. First one is the word confidence. Faith is confidence in God. Confidence that God is who He says He is and that He will accomplish what He has said He's going to accomplish and that He will fulfill His promises. Folks, if you don't take anything else with you today from my message, please take this statement with you. Faith is really an unshakable confidence that God will accomplish His purpose and fulfill His promises. And the other word I want to highlight is hope. In the Bible, hope always has to do with the future. Hope is the word for every good thing God has promised you in your lifetime, especially in the long-term future, especially in that part of your life that transcends your journey through this world. The author wants to make it clear that in due time, God will fulfill all of His promises. And he also says that you really can't talk about one of these without talking about the other. That's because hope is really faith looking forward. It's faith projected into the future. It's trusting God for the future. And faith is what keeps hope alive. Faith gives the assurance that the promises that God has made to us will be fulfilled. He starts out by saying, by faith we see that the universe and the world around us were formed by the command of God. The scripture declares that God literally spoke this physical and material reality we live in into being. He willed that this world in its many dimensions, earth, water, air, the heavens, would exist. And then He spoke it into being. And then the author starts on this list of examples about how faith has carried people through their lifetimes and what it has accomplished for them. Verses 4 through 7 concentrate on the pre-flood world of Abel, Enoch, and Noah. They show us how faith enables us to please God. Our acts of faith are pleasing to God. Did you know that? When we live by faith, when we do anything, when we take a step of faith, that pleases God, that honors God. Notice it says, Abel brought a more acceptable offering to God. That, of course, takes us back to Genesis chapter 4, which says that Abel brought the best of his flocks to the Lord. Cain, his brother, it says, simply brought some of his crops. Do you see the difference between the two? One brought something mediocre, something generic. The other, Abel made it a point to bring the best that he had and present it to God. Abel was putting God's interests ahead of his own. And folks, that's how faith works. We get lots of opportunities like this throughout our lifetime, don't we? Shall we worship God with the best that we have to give? Or should we just kind of show up, go through the motions, put it in the rearview mirror, and then head out for whatever else is in our lives. That was Cain who did that. Shall we tithe the first and the best of what God has given to us, all of our income, 
Or should we just put in a random offering? Whatever God might need, whatever might help God, I'll just put something in the offering plate. See, Abel was willing to make a big sacrifice to God, and he showed that his heart belongs to God. He wanted to honor God, and for that reason, God approved of him. Then there's Enoch. Enoch was an early descendant of Adam whose faith was seen in his close fellowship with God. Two verses, back to back in Genesis chapter 5, verse 22, verse 23, call out Enoch for the close fellowship with God that he lived in. Since we learn in the Scripture that the primary reason God created all of us is to live in fellowship with Him, it blesses God. It pleases God. When we make our fellowship, our relationship with God a priority, instead of acting like we're so busy and have so many responsibilities that, you know, we barely have time to spend with God. Enoch made the most of his fellowship with God. And for that reason, at the ripe young age of 365, the Lord took him home directly to heaven without him having to pass through the pain and the struggle of death. Now, if you go back and read those chapters, you'll discover 365 was pretty young by comparison with the others who lived in those days. In other words, and he looked at it this way, he got his heavenly reward early and he didn't have to pass through the rigors of death and dying to get there. And it's with reference to Enoch that we are reminded here of uh, a marvelous statement that the Apostle Paul made in the book of Romans too, and that is, without faith it is impossible for anyone to please God. Did you hear that? Without faith, this is the basic foundation, it is impossible for anyone to please God. And then there's Noah. By faith, Noah built a large boat in the middle of the desert. Now, imagine what an astonishing act of faith that was. Who builds a boat in the middle of the desert, all right? But because of it, Noah stood as a signpost of God's coming judgment. In other words, everybody that came along, all of his friends who said, No, what are you doing? Really, what are you doing building a boat in the middle of the desert. Come on, man. It was an opportunity for Noah to say, hey, the judgment of God is coming because of the wickedness of this generation, because we've turned our backs on God in so many ways. His judgment is coming in the form of a flood. You better get ready. But nobody took his advice. Noah was acting in faith, and that faith made him righteous. Then we come to Abraham and Sarah. They show us how faith enables us to obey God. The task God gave Abraham was huge. He said, leave your home and everything near and dear to you and go to this new land that I will give you. And Abraham, even though nobody around him, nobody in Mesopotamia, had any idea who this God Almighty was, did it. And he went. Now, how's that for confidence in God? Folks, God still calls people to leave everything familiar and follow him to some unknown place. Did you know that God is still in the business of doing that? Sometimes we do this in a small way. Sometimes we do it in a big way. I uh, understand that we do live in a mobile society. People move around a lot. In my years here, I've seen this happen with lots of KCC families who picked up and moved to some other place. We've gone through it a couple of times with the big airplane company that's located not far from here where they sort of ship people around the country. But folks, it's one thing to move cross country to take a job that is a lot like the one you already have. Maybe it's a promotion. Maybe there's even a raise in pay. It's something quite different to do what Abraham did. What a lot of our missionaries still do. I think of Johanna and Mackenzie Conver who recently returned to Asia to continue their work there. 
leaving everything familiar, the country, the place, the family they grew up with, and going someplace where you have to learn a whole new language, you have to learn a whole new culture, new customs. It's an altogether different climate. I mean, you really do start all over again. My most memorable experience with this was when I left my teaching job and my family and my friends in the Portland area to go to seminary and eventually uh, into a life in the ministry that I had no idea where would lead me or where I would end up. But even that kept me in a culture I was familiar with. Well, except for the year that I spent in Chicago. That's a different culture back there, okay? I have friends visiting from Chicago today. It really is a different culture. Trust me on that. Abraham left it all behind. And he never did get truly established in the promised land. That's the other thing to keep in mind. He lived as a wanderer and so did his children in tents. Right? I mean, it would be several more generations and a long time displaced from that promised land before his descendants would get to return and inhabit the land that God had promised them. And the author makes it clear that Abraham was willing to do that because his faith told him life in this world is what? Temporary. It's temporary anyway. So he was willing to dwell in those tents. He was looking for the city with eternal foundations. That's the way God calls all of us to live, the eternal heavenly city of God. Because of that, we're told God was not ashamed to be associated with Abraham. God was happy to call Abraham his child. Now, I don't know about you, but, you know, I was kind of reading along there, and I thought it would be the other way around. I thought it would say Abraham was not ashamed to call God Almighty his God you know, standing out among all the others. That's not what it says. It says God was pleased to call Abraham his child. In other words, God is delighted to be associated with his people. That's God saying, Abraham's good people, and it's fine with me if my name is associated with him and what he does. Now, isn't it true, parents, we're used to our kids kind of going through phases where they want to sort of establish some independence from us and distance themselves from us a little bit, okay, particularly, you know, as they pass through adolescence, right? I'm right about this, aren't I? Yeah, you, kids kind of feel like, well, you know, I don't really want to be seen with my parents. I, want to, I don't really want to be associated with them, all right? Okay. Well, parents, isn't it also true that there are times when you don't particularly want to be associated with your kids? I mean, aren't there times when you don't really want to be known as the parent of that kid? That happens too. One of the uh, funny stories we tell within our family, um, most of you know that my wife had a 30-year career with United Airlines as a flight attendant. And um, once when my two sons were really young, a five-year-old and a three-year-old, we were going to go out and greet her when she came home from her flight, okay? She'd been gone for a couple days. And um, this was pre-9-11, so you could go all the way to the gate area, the waiting area, and greet people right when they got off the plane, all right? Okay, so our youngest son had recently gotten this uh, set of Superman pajamas. And he was so proud of his Superman pajamas. He just wanted to wear them everywhere. He wanted to wear his Superman pajamas to the airport, okay? And I tried to talk him out of it, and I tried to say, nah, it's not a good idea, don't do that. But he was bound and determined. He was going to wear those Superman pajamas to the airport. I thought, you know what, I'm not going to argue with him over it. That's fine. But the Superman pajamas that he had, they just had these blue bottoms, you know, these blue trousers. And um, 
The real Superman had those red trunks that he wore around his waist, the bright red trunks. You remember those? Okay. Well, his pajamas didn't have that. So he decided to solve that problem by going into his dresser and pulling out a pair of little kid underwear. All right? And pulling those up over the outside of his Superman pajamas. I want to tell you, it really looked goofy. Okay? And I thought, well, he just really wants to do this. And, you know, it's kind of cute. And anyway, he's only three years old. I mean, what difference does it make? Who cares? So I took my two sons to the airport. And we waited for that flight. And here came Michelle off the flight at the end. I wish you could have seen the look on her face (laughs) when she saw her son wearing those Superman pajamas with the underwear on the outside. She was fit to be tied, not the least bit amused, and I still have not heard the end of it, okay? And uh, you know the worst of it was she'd been bragging to her flight attendant friends about how she had these two little kids and what nice kids they were, and one of them said, who is that goofy little kid with his underwear on the outside of his pajamas? And she got to say, that's my son. (laughs) The power of this statement in verse 16 is that God is not ashamed to be associated with his people who live a life of trusting him. He's happy to be associated with us. He still feels that way. It was by faith that Abraham and Sarah received God's promise of a son, even though Sarah was too old to conceive. And remember the story. She had never been able to conceive anyway. And yes, we remember that when she first heard the news that she was going to have this baby from the heavenly visitors, what did she do? She laughed. She couldn't believe it. And then they made this desperate, tragic attempt to try and fulfill the promise in their own way using Hagar, Sarah's servant. And you remember what a, an absolute soap opera that turned their lives into. But in the end, they came back to the place of completely trusting God and they saw God fulfill His promise to them. The supreme test of faith came when Abraham was told to sacrifice that miracle child to God. By now, Abraham had learned to trust God completely. He obeyed God's will, prepared his son to be sacrificed, raised the knife up above him to kill his son, believing that maybe this God whose power was unlimited would restore his son to him. By resurrection, that's what it says. But the raised knife and the determination of Abraham to obey God is all that God needed to see. And he intervened and provided a ram instead. Folks, without faith, not only is it impossible to please God, but it's impossible to obey God because he calls us to do hard things that don't always make sense at the time. Next, faith enables us to see beyond death. Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph were all on their deathbed when they took additional steps of faith. They took additional steps. They didn't shrink back from it. Everything they were hoping for in their lifetimes had not been accomplished and yet they were not stymied. Verses 20 through 22 speak about the blessings that Isaac gave to his two sons, Jacob and Esau. And yes, there is that nasty matter of Jacob deceiving his father to get the better blessing. But in the end, Isaac gave each of them a blessing, a promise about things God would do in their lives in the future. You see, Isaac wanted them to continue the trajectory of his walk with God. And parents, isn't that really the most important thing we all want for our children to continue in the life of faith? 
And a very aged Jacob blessed his grandsons, the sons of Joseph, Manasseh, and Ephraim. He promised that God would make their descendants great tribes in Israel. And the point is, even death doesn't quash faith. Even death doesn't stop the purpose of God. No one who trusts in God need ever fear death. Even more, these patriarchs, as we call them, knew God's purpose, which would eventually express itself in the emergence of Israel, and then out of Israel would come the Savior of the whole world. They knew that promise was still intact and moving forward, and many of the things they dreamed about were still off in the future, way off in the future somewhere. And even though they wanted them fulfilled in their own lifetime, that didn't happen. So they handed the promises off to their children and to their grandchildren, and they said, God will do this. Walk with Him and trust in Him, and don't give up. Folks, to this day, death doesn't end the life of a believer. The exclamation point was put on that truth with the resurrection of Jesus out of death. And after we die, God's purpose in this world and in the lives of our children goes on. It doesn't die with us. Within our own congregation, I think back to Bob Monahan who was such an enthusiastic supporter of our building programs and particularly the one that built our student ministry center. Bob saw all the things we were trying to do with students around here and the very cramped quarters we had in what we used to call the wedge. And, you know, he became a part of the leadership group for the stewardship campaign, Bridge to Our Future. He died before that building was built. But on my last visit with him, a couple of days before his death, I was able to say to him, Bob, they've laid the foundation. The construction is starting. You're not going to see it in your time here. But it's happening. What you dreamed about and what you worked for, it's happening. And that gave him joy. He was happy to hear that. When we die, we join God in the eternal bliss of His dwelling place. That's a good thing. His purpose here on this earth doesn't stop. It goes on. He continues to work it out. And the many people I know about who have included KCC in their wills are demonstrating the same kind of faith. They want to bless God's work here even after they're gone. They want to see it go forward. Last, faith enables us to act boldly in the face of trouble. This last group from verse 23 on all have in common that their faith inspired them to act boldly against overwhelming odds. Moses' parents acted in faith when they defied Pharaoh's order and they hid their baby boy in a reed basket in and amongst the reeds in the Nile River eventually to be found by Pharaoh's daughter. Moses acted in faith when he chose to identify with the Hebrew slaves from which he came rather than live the life of luxury as an adult that he was entitled to as one who grew up in the palace. And Moses acted in faith when he answered God's call and led the children of Israel out of their slavery in Egypt, that too against the will of Pharaoh. By faith, the children of Israel walked through the Red Sea as God parted the waters, making it possible for them with the Egyptian army in hot pursuit. By faith, a much weaker Israelite band conquered the Canaanite stronghold of Jericho without shooting an arrow, swinging a sword, or throwing a spear. 
And even a Jericho prostitute by the name of Rahab responded in faith when given the opportunity and hid the Israelite spies. And then comes a long list of those who acted in faith against the odds and saw God do amazing, sometimes miraculous things. Gideon, David, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, Samuel, and the prophets were all great heroes of faith. And they were great heroes of faith because they refused to give in in the face of overwhelming odds. And the author declares in verse 38, they were too good for this world. That's an interesting statement, isn't it? They were too good for this world. And what he's saying is they were rejected because this world could never come to grips with the depth of their faith and their loyalty to God. They had an unshakable confidence. They could not be shaken loose from their commitment to God. Verses 39 and 40 summarize what the author has been been saying throughout this message <clears throat> will you join me let's say these verses together all these people earned a good reputation yet none of them received all that God had promised for God had something better in mind for us so that they would not reach perfection without us you notice that without us God's plan encompasses all of us. It wasn't finished before we appeared in this world. And His good purpose for our lives continues on toward His ultimate goal of redeeming this entire world and eradicating sin and evil altogether. We're a part of the story as we continue on. So his word to us is don't give up because you haven't seen every promise of God fulfilled in your life. Take the long view. God is not finished yet. He's not done yet. Fulfillment will come. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. God, it is by faith, and we admit that we need more faith to understand that your purpose is being fulfilled year by year as we march toward that ultimate goal when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. And we'll see that new heavens and that new earth, and we'll dwell with you forever in that great relationship that you always had in mind for us. A close relationship with you around your throne, worshiping and glorifying your name. Until then, God, keep us going. Keep us moving. Keep us trusting in you. We thank you for your goodness and your mercy. In Jesus' name, amen.